Today's reading comes from Joshua chapter 4. Twelve memorial stones from the Jordan. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste, and when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him, just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests bearing the ark of their testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests come up out of the Jordan, and when the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. The people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day, on the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal, on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is the word of the Lord. You may have your seats. If I had a voice like that, (laughs) as I've said, I would, yeah. I wasn't finished though. If I had a voice like that, (laughs) I wouldn't stop talking. You know what I mean? Like I'd go up to people. You want me to read something for you? It's like, I'll read something for you. You'll be enthralled. I'll change your life. (laughs) Well, good morning. Great to be with you. Uh, My name is Norm. If I haven't met you before, uh, if you're a guest, visitor, I along with Josh and and everybody else want to welcome you here. Now, if I, if I was sitting where you're sitting and I just kind of got in here a little bit groggy perhaps, haven't had my second cup of coffee yet or whatever, and, and I just heard what was just read, I think at least some of you, if I can put myself in your position, at least I think some of you would be a tad confused. 
I mean, what is that? I mean, I think at least some of you would be asking and perhaps are asking the question, how is any of that relevant to my life? Well, my answer is in every way imaginable. Especially, but not only, but especially if you're asking questions of the Christian faith. If you're considering some things, if you're asking questions, if you're kicking the tires of Christianity, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better chapter than, than Joshua chapter 4. In fact, of all the chapters in the Bible, again, you'd find it difficult to find one that encapsulates the Christian faith better than Joshua 4, especially re when it's read in light of, of chapter 3. I say that because if you like a good story or you like images, you're into movies, in other words, you like good storytelling by way of not just hearing it, but sort of putting yourself in the middle of it, then again, these two chapters, chapters three and four of Joshua, might be your magnus opus. They're that good. Let me prove it to you. If you have any doubt, let me prove it to you by focusing. What we're going to do is focus on four words, four words alone that will move us forward this morning. Let me give them to you all in the front end and then we'll double back on them. The four words are movement. That's number one. Monument. That's number two. The third is meaning. And then we'll close with the word message. So that's what's going to kind of weave its way through the next few minutes together. So let's take them one at a time, beginning with, with the word movement. Now, when I use the word movement, what I'm talking about is the movement of the people of God, the people of Israel, from, from their wilderness journey through, through the River Jordan into the Promised Land, which takes us back to last week. This is what we looked at last week in chapter 3. So let me remind you of what Matt walked us through by giving you the big picture on the front end. Big picture, and I just gave you a little bit of it already. The people of God having sojourned for 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert wilderness, passed through the Jordan River, and they set foot on the land that had been promised to them way back. They're finally there. That's the big picture. But do you remember some of the details that we looked at last week as well? And as Matt highlighted for us, at least some of them. I, I asked that question and I ask you to consider some of the details because no detail in that story is unimportant. To start, the people stood before the Jordan River, but not just any Jordan River. A, a flooded Jordan River. The, they were looking at a river that was overflowing its banks. They were looking at a river that was flowing fast. It wasn't a meandering brook. It was a rushing torrent of water. That's a really important detail. Don't throw that aside or gloss over it too quickly. For about the last 20 years, uh, I've made it a practice as much as I can to go up to the interior in the summer and play in a golf tournament just outside of Kamloops. It's at a course called River Shore. It's because it's a golf course on the shore of a river. Very creative name. And it always takes place, it always takes place on the August long weekend. And so it's very hot as it can be in the interior most often. And I love that. I love the heat. I love golf. I love the whole thing. And so if I can get away, I get away and I, I, play a, I play a tournament there with some buddies of mine most often. If it works out based on when our rounds are and all of that kind of thing, one of the things that my buddies and I do after we play a round of golf in the, in the tournament is we, 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 we don't go into the clubhouse to cool down. What we do is we meet in the parking lot, we jump into to the car, van, or whatever we're driving in, and we jack up the heat. Like we turn it all the way up like it's January. We, so, we jack, so you're playing golf, sweaty, gross, 35 degrees like it can be. Get in the car, jack up the heat, and we make about a five-kilometer trek down to a part of the river where you can drive your car really close to the river. Then we jump out of the van. Now, we are hot now. Like hot, stinky, gross, still in our golf stuff. And then we immediately jump into the river with all of our stuff on it. Now, you may wonder, why do you do this? Well, we do this because this is what cool people do in the middle of summer. So if you're cool, this is the kind of stuff you do. 
But here's the thing, when you jump into the river, when you jump into the river, you can't go very far out. This is a part of the Thompson River that is moving really fast. It looks benign on the surface. But if you go out more than eight to 10 feet, the next thing that you'll find happening is you popping out next to the airport in Richmond. All right, that's what will happen to you. Because the river's moving, man. I mean, it's flowing. You'll see uh, speedboats coming up the river. You can just tell that they've got it pegged, but they're barely moving. I mean, it's, it, it would be impossible to get to the other side. You'd kill yourself. As we go back to Joshua 3, leading into chapter 4, we, we need to note, west side, that the river, the Jordan, at this stage, at this time of the year, was impossible to cross. No sane person would attempt to. What stood between the people of God and the promised land was certain death. Now, there's a reason why I'm hammering this point home. One of the main reasons is because in the Bible, water, of all things, water is oftentimes associated with sin and chaos and death. That water in the form of the Red Sea, going back to that journey, in the form of the Red Sea stood between the people of God and freedom from Egypt and now stands between the people of God and entrance into the promised land is no coincidence. See the picture. See the image. Put yourself, put yourself into this. this. This image serves a purpose for, for the Israelites to enter the promised land. Demanded that they pass through death or have somebody else pass through it for them. Which is exactly what happened. For if you remember, per the instructions of the Lord, think back to last week, Joshua had the priests of the people enter the water first while carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And as soon as they, the priests, carrying this Ark, stepped into the river, the water stopped. The water stopped. West side, certain death stopped. And the people just walked on by. Now, as Matt pointed out so well last week, whether, whether you see the journey through these waters as representing salvation or ongoing faithfulness doesn't really matter. For the call is the same. A, a call to trust and obey, walk in faith, Trust and obey, all met with what? All met with the gracious intervention of God. So many images come out of this crossing. We've talked about these priests and we've talked about the ark, but what do priests do? What role do they play? Well, they're, they're go-betweens. They're, they're mediators. They, they stand between God and humanity. That's the role priests serve. The ones carrying the ark, that's the role they had for the people of God. But what about the ark? Well, what does the ark represent? Well, again, going back to last week, Matt told us, and it's a great reminder to us today, it represents the glory of God's presence. It's the most precious piece of furniture in Israel, and it represented God's glorious presence with his people. The, the ark, as I talked about on Good Friday, and again, as Matt reminded us of last Sunday, was normally kept in the most holy place in the tabernacle, the holy of holies. And at this point in history, here, Joshua 3 and 4, at this point in its history, it held three items. The three items that the ark, this vessel of God's presence held were, number one, the tablets that had the Ten Commandments written on them. That's one item. The second item was something called Aaron's rod or Aaron's staff. Aaron was the high priest, spokesperson for Moses. The third item was a golden bowl containing some pieces of manna. All three of these items represent something vital too. The, the manna, 
The manna that sustained the people of God in the wilderness represents the life-sustaining food that God gave his people as they sojourned in the wilderness. But the significance of this provision goes through the roof. When you hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 6, where he states there, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he, that's Jesus, who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So that's manna. Manna then, fast forward, manna, true manna, realized and fulfilled in in Christ. The importance of, of Aaron's rod or staff is found in Numbers 16 and 17. You can read that on your own. Where some jealous men, they, they, they called Aaron's priesthood into question. So the scene is set. Guy's jealous of the leadership that Aaron had. So they call it into question. God intervenes and says, I want you to throw all of your staffs right next to Aaron's. And what did God do? He caused Aaron's to bud. It's like having a walking stick and all of a sudden starts growing leaves out of it. But again, fast forward to the New Testament, where the writer of Hebrews reminds us that God, God, God is the one who chooses his high priest, which is fulfilled again in fullest measure in Christ. I mean, the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 specifically, he tells us that Christ was appointed. He was appointed high priest, and he is a priest forever. So we have, we have the We have Aaron's rod, we have the manna, and and finally we have the Ten Commandments. Now, what do they depict? Well, they depict how the moral law of God stands forever, and it does. God has a moral requirement that you and I fulfill. As true today as it was then. What's the problem? We can't. You have to fulfill it. I can't. All right? You're in a world of hurt. You're in a world of hurt. What's our hope? Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our hope because of what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, telling us there that God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Why can't we do it? Because we're weak in our flesh. We can't do it. So how does he do it? By sending his own son in order that the righteous requirement, really important word, righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So this moral law stands forever. We can't keep it. Oh, we're in trouble. Okay, Jesus did it. And he gives us his perfection. Praise God. Do you you see what's going on? Again, I call you to see this. Don't just hear it. I want you to see it. I want you to see the images. I want you to see the items. I want you to see the river. I want you to see the ark. I want you to picture what's inside. I want you to see how it's fulfilled in Christ. Just hear the story, man. All all of the items contained in the vessel of God's presence pointed ahead to something far greater. They were a shadow of things to come, all contained in and fulfilled by Christ. But there's a problem. And the problem is there's a flip side. For example, the the Ten Commandments also represent, represent mankind's rebellion against God's law. And Aaron, Aaron's rod represents mankind's rejection of God's appointed leadership. And the manna represents mankind's rejection of God's provision. Woe to us! Woe to us! Mankind's rejection and, and rebellion all contained in the vessel of God's glorious presence. 
Let me say that again. Mankind's humanity's rejection and rebellion all contained in the vessel of God's glorious presence. Are you seeing this? But, but the question that you may have is, is why? Why would you carry that around? Why would you do that? Well, the answer is because of what it was covered with. The, these items which pointed ahead to something far greater while also depicting mankind's rebellion were, were covered with a seat and that seat was called mercy. A, a mercy seat which on a yearly basis was covered with blood for the forgiveness of all the people's sin. I've asked the question already a number of times, but are you seeing this? That the people of God are standing before the flooded Jordan River. On the other side is, is, is the promised land, but here in between is certain death. If they step in, certain death, but, but not to worry. For, for Joshua calls the priests the go-betweens to enter the water first, but not on their own, while carrying the, the blood-sprinkled and mercy-covered ark. And as soon as they step in, as soon as they take on death, in the place of the people, the water stops. And the people walk on by into the promised land. I mean, praise God. But if you haven't done this already, and again, if you're just kicking tires this morning, maybe I can help you think more deeply in this. If the ark represents God's glorious presence, where, where do we see that fleshed out in its fullness? Well, in Jesus, the God-man, the one who came to make God known, the one whom the fullness of deity dwells in, in bodily form. The one, the one who came to fulfill all things, like the law. And, and the high priesthood. And who is the bread of heaven. While also carrying the sin and rebellion of all humanity. Westside, Jesus is our priest. And he is our ark too. He is the one who entered death in our place so we could walk on by. And I, and I probably don't need to remind you that Jesus was baptized. And not just anywhere. But in the waters of the Jordan. Jesus was buried in the waters of the Jordan. And why? Why? Because as he said to John the Baptist, so that righteousness would be fulfilled. A righteousness that is now ours in Christ Jesus. So that's Israel's movement. That was all last week. We haven't even got to our chapter yet. Let's get to chapter 4. Today, as we enter chapter 4, the nation is on the other side. They've finally gone to the other side, except for the priests who remain in the dried up Jordan. It's at this point that the Lord instructs Joshua to choose 12 men, one from each tribe, to go back into the dried up Jordan where the, the priests and the ark are and, and choose 12 stones to memorialize the day, which leads to the second word that guides us this morning. That word is monument. That the movement of, from, the, from the wilderness to the promised land was to be memorialized with a, with a monument. So that's what the Lord does. He instructs Joshua to do that. One from each tribe go back into the Jordan and they pick 12 stones, one each. From the riverbed and they are called to carry them to the place where they'd camp, camp next. By the way, can you imagine going back in into the river? Be a little freaky. 
Water's just stopping. And you got to double back. I think I'd go last, perhaps. Let the other guys go ahead of me just to, just to make sure. But they do. And then they grab 12 stones. And they carry them to a place called Gilgal, which is located about eight miles away from where this event takes place. And there they take the 12 stones. They build a monument commemorating that all-important day. But Joshua isn't done. Joshua doubles back, goes back into the dried up river. He too grabs 12 stones and he builds a monument of his own in the river. He builds a monument in the river that will be covered up by water most of the year. He builds a monument that most people would never see. Huh. At this point, Joshua, he exits the Jordan. He instructs the people to do the same. And as soon as they do, the Jordan re returns to its former flooded and unpassable state. Now, at this point, you need to forgive me if you think I'm taking things too far. But can I remind you that once you've entered the promised land, it's impossible, go to, impossible to go back to the other side? What the Lord does cannot be undone by the flesh. So we have movement and not one but two monuments which brings us to our third word and that word is meaning. What do the purpose or what purpose do the monuments serve? And why build them this way? Why, why build them with, with 12 stones and not one big one? And, and why stones from the river and not the river bank? And, and why carry 12 stones eight miles away and set the monument up there? Why not build it on the river bank where the event took place? And why two monuments? Why, why does Joshua build one in the river where no one would see it? Why do something no one would see? So many questions. So let's take them. Let's address them one at a time, beginning with, with some of the more easy ones. First of all, what role does the monument serve? Well, we don't have to guess at this. Joshua tells us, if you look at verse 6 and 7, he states there that the 12 stones were to serve as a memorial of that day. But look at verse 6. He adds in verse 6 that they were to serve as a sign to leading the children to ask, what do they mean? What do these stones mean? The, the memorial, therefore, would lead to opportunities to pass on from one generation to the next the story of God's saving work when they ask. So that's the monument's purpose. Big picture. But there's more. There's more that we need to consider. Why 12 stones? Well, well because they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's why 12 stones. But why is that important? Again, why not just have a couple? Why not one big one? Why not have some one, just one big stone? You can, you know, notch out some things in it commemorating the day. Why, why, why 12? Well, I think it's to remind the people that this was a national salvation act. It, it represents the the now nation of Israel, again, as Matt emphasized last week. In other words, it, it was a work that included the whole community of God's people. This wasn't exclusive to one or two tribes. It, it included everyone. Much like communion today. The Lord's Supper, this supper, is a memorial too. It's, it's a meal as well to be eaten so that the generations to follow ask, what does this mean? It's also important to remember this is a communal meal. A communal meal. As Paul as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen, 17, it's a meal to be eaten when we come together. I, I won't die on this hill, and, and I say that because some of you may disagree with my, my view on this, but I don't believe communion is to be partaken privately. 
in, in the same way that the memorial wasn't to be built with one or two stones. It's a meal meant to depict that God has saved this fellowship. So that's why 12 stones. That's why 12 stones. But why 12 stones from, from the river? Why not 12 stones from the, the river bank? Well, the right and I believe very obvious answer is because it will remind them that they crossed over the Jordan. Seems rather obvious. And I, and I think that's the right answer. I think it's a, a key part of the answer. But I, I think there's more. I think there's more. And I, I don't mean to offend you when I say this. So please forgive me if I do. But I take this as a screw you to the river. We walked into death and we took something from it and we built a memorial out of it. I, I, I take this and, and, and suggest this because I, I, think, I think of what Paul does at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter. And he lays out the importance of the resurrection and what Jesus has done in conquering death. And as that, chapter, as that chapter wraps up, Paul cries out, I mean, exclamation points everywhere. Paul cries out, death, you have been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Jesus killed death. Jesus walked into death and he destroyed it. Death is an enemy. Our last and greatest enemy. Jesus walked in and he killed it. And do you know what he did? He rolled away a stone. That's why I say this. But why hike the 12 stones and build the memorial in Gilgal? Why hike the stones 12, eight, miles, eight miles away? Well, the answer is because Gilgal became base camp. It became a location the soldiers would come back to after battle, and the monument there served as an ongoing reminder to them and the people of God's saving power and fulfiller of his promises. It's the Lord saying, build this monument there, where you can see it in remembrance of me. And last, why, why does Joshua, <coughs> why does Joshua, I'll say it one more time, why does Joshua, it's terrible preaching, why does Joshua re, re enter the river and build a monument, monument of his own? He does this on his own volition. There is no instruction. Take, take those stones to Gilgal. I'm doubling back. And I'm going to build something in the river that no one else sees. Why? Lots of guesses out there. But I think more than anything else, it was an act of worship. I believe it was a display where it didn't matter if others saw, for God would. Which should remind us of something Jesus teaches on in the Sermon on the Mount. When you fast, when you pray, <coughs> when you give, do so in secret. So that the Father who sees in secret will see and Reward. These three acts, by the way, prayer, fasting, giving, encapsulate the Christian life. They, they depict our trust and our denial of self and our giving to others. Do all of these, Jesus says, covered by water. And, and be satisfied. <coughs> be satisfied that God sees, even if no one else does. That is a challenge, isn't it? 
See, God always sees. There's it's nothing he does not see. He sees your good works even if nobody else does. Even if nobody cares. He sees. And that's the call of the Christian life. So what do we have? We have three words thus far. We have movement. We have monument. Two, in fact. And we have pondered their meaning. So let's wrap up by considering the last word. That word is message. What is the message in all of this to us? <clears throat> I've more than hinted at some already. But as I close, begin to close, very beginning of closing, <laughs> what, what I want you, it, so this, this is really important. What is the message in all of this to us? Well, what I want you to, to know, first of all, more than anything else, is that this story is our story. J Joshua chapter 3 and jo Joshua chapter 4, this is, this is our story. Not only these two chapters, we're going to see more as we continue on, obviously, and we already have seen things relevant to us as well. But this is, this is our story. And therefore, when I'm considering what is the message in this to us, and I'm, I'm trying to put myself back into your place, what I want you to understand is that if you, please hear me, if you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, that then standing before you and eternal life is an unpassable, overflowing, rushing torrent of eternal death. And any attempt to pass through it on your own will only lead to destruction. You can't. <clears throat> that's, that's the reality. But it doesn't need to be yours. That reality doesn't need to be yours. For someone entered it for you. A go-between. A great and eternal high priest. Someone who in them carried our sin and rebellion and offers blood-bought mercy in exchange. He entered death and he stopped it for us, allowing us to walk through to the other side. His name is Jesus. Come to him today. If that's where you stand and you can see the other side, but in between is this, as you reflect on your life, you want that, but as you reflect on your life, see the unpassability of what stands between you and that and come to Jesus because he entered it for you. Come to him and say, Jesus, take my sin, rebellion, rejection, take it and, and give me something in exchange. Give me mercy in exchange. And he will. He promises that he will. He stands at the ready. And he will. <clears throat> Excuse my sniffles and coughs. But perhaps you've already made that decision. Then, then what's the message to you? And what's the message to me? Well, our call, as we will see in the weeks ahead, is to enter the battle that is ours. We, we daily enter a battle. When you say yes to Christ, you enter a battle immediately. So our call is to enter that battle, to daily get up and clothe ourselves which, with the armor that is ours in Christ. So we enter that battle, and then our call is to battle and return and remember and worship and then go back to battle and return and remember and worship. And, and here's, the, here's the thing. Jesus has given us two memorials to remember by. One in water and one out. 
One is a one-time act, the act of baptism, where we go into the waters of death with Jesus and come out taking on the new life that he mercifully gives to us. We've got a baptism on June 30th. Lots of Westsiders getting baptized. Join them. If you haven't been baptized, join them. Love to baptize, baptize you. We're doing, like I said, down at the ocean. It's going to be great. And the other is the ongoing fellowship meal of, of communion, a meal of remembrance. And, and why are we called to remember? Well, as I've said 23,000 times over the years here, because we have a great tendency to forget. And so after a week of battles, we come back to this Gilgal, a name which means roll away your reproach. We come back to this Gilgal where we find sanctuary to worship and to remember that God has rolled away our reproach by way of the cross. There it is, the cross. So that's the message in all of, the, all of this to us. But there's one final thing that I want to close with and I want you to notice that comes out of the last few verses of this chapter. Let me read verses 21 to 24. It's on the screen behind me as well. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea which he dried up for us until we passed over so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is Joshua's great commission. That the monument in Gilgal wasn't only to be for the nation of Israel, but to the peoples of the earth. That they too would know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, which is what happened with Rahab, by the way, and the Red Sea crossing. But, but I have to ask as I wrap up. I have to ask, what is the monument today that is to be on display? I mean, we don't have a Jordan River. We don't have 12 stones from the Jordan River. And the fact is, most people won't come in here and watch us take this. Most people won't even even see a baptism, even if they're down at the beach, they probably won't even notice what's going on. So what's, what's the monument to be put on display so that the peoples of the earth will know that the hand of the Lord is mighty? It's us. We're the monument. We're the 12 stones, the church, the church, imperfect as we are, the church is through the church that the manifold wisdom of God is made known. It's us. By way of our works, by way of our words, and by way of our love for one another, display to the peoples of the earth that the hand of the Lord is mighty. That's a message I hope we all hear. For the sake of the peoples in this city. And so many other cities besides. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh God, I love your word. I so love your word. Love it. And in spirit of God, I thank you that you reveal things to us. That we can drop into a text like Joshua chapter 4, Joshua chapter 3, and we can see and be encouraged by it. I just love it. 
but coming out of this with the realization, oh Father, with the realization that we're the monument. Oh, we need your help. Strengthen us. Convict us. Change us. If we're not loving someone, may we love someone here. Make things right. It's by our love for one another that people will know that you are my disciples, Jesus said. It's, 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 it's the greatest of all apologetics. Christian loving a Christian. We need more spirit. I just, just pour your spirit on this place, in this city. If we who are evil can give good gifts to our children, how much more will a father give the spirit to his children when they ask? So we ask. More spirit, please. More strength. I pray for those that don't know you here. Shine in dark places today, I pray. We love you. We love you so much. Jesus, thank you for entering the waters for us. Allowing us just to walk on by. Oh, man. We so love you. We praise you and we bless you and we thank you. And now we remember you until we see you again face to face. Amen.